Zbate. Ok. Super. So, hello everyone. I am Fesif Bayou. And, uh, yeah, I am a uh, uh, Jupiter. Did a very quick and nice introduction. So, I am a PhD student working on uh, risk mass testing for quite some time now, since 2017. And uh, yeah, today I'm talking about recent last simulations to understand the local mechanical behavior of multiphase materials and uh, how these simulations are being used uh, for targeted material and process engineering. What I have uh, in my presentation today is basically I will quickly talk about the background, why microstructurally informed modeling is important and necessary, as well as um, uh, the basics and uh, uh, some theoretical background. Then I will talk about a little bit about the objectives, uh, the selection and calibration of the model. Uh, I will talk about the methodology uh, and uh, uh, results of different uh, examples. And I will switch between methodology and results to and from multiple times when I will talk about one example case I will talk about the methodology first and then the results again and in the next example I will go back to methodology again and results again so it will be easier to follow and then in the end I will conclude my presentation on how these crystal plus models can be widely used and, and, and for different applications and in the end I will give an outlook of, about some issues which can be addressed in the future something which you might be interested in can pick up um, yeah so with the background in mind, let me select this laser pointer, it will be easier. Oh, I cannot do this. Why I can't do this? No, I can't. But anyways, so we are familiar with the uh, mechanical properties of materials and their stress strain behaviors. Um, so we know that when we apply load, uh, material, um, according to its intrinsic attributes, deforms. Uh, sometimes it absorbs less energy, sometimes it absorbs more energy. Uh, there is a difference between brittle and tile behavior and so on and so on. And uh, basically the materials which can undergo large deformation and have high stress handling capacity are needed in several applications, for example, in automotive sector. And um, because such materials are easy to form in desired shape, uh, they depict good uh, mechanical properties. Uh, and I don't know. Um, they depict good um, service life and have high energy capacity during crash. Now, the mechanical behavior of uh, such materials is influenced by um, the microstructural attributes, um, and which means that the overall component. Uh, on a large scale is just being uh, the behavior of a large scale component is just being dictated by uh, how microstructurally the material is um, developed or shaped and just remember that when we are talking about crystal plasticity we are talking about this meso scale so we were talking about this scale throughout our presentation and not about the structural scales um, the mechanical properties of the materials um, are depending on the microstructure, uh, uh, which actually are dependent on the grain size and orientation distribution. When we talk about the uh, microstructure, um, generally the differences which are happening there are grain size and orientation distribution, manufacturing techniques employed, deformation degree and strain rate, uh, composition of the phase, chemistry of the material, and um, also working temperatures. So all these attributes affect the overall behavior of the material. Um, what happens is that uh, these changes affect the atomic adjustments, uh, the microstructural features, uh, which in turn affect the large scale deformation behavior, and that is what we experience uh, on a component scale or large scale. So what we are interested in doing is, we are interested in developing models for materials at these smaller scales, so we can model all these things while doing the modeling. We can um, consider all these things while doing the modeling and uh, it helps in uh, developing um, skill bridging simulations. So when we know the material deformation behavior at a smaller scale, we can predict how it behaves at large scale. 
So basically, um, when I talk about uh, crystal plasticity basics, uh, I will quickly uh, go through some of the very fundamental basics and start to build over that. So we know that um, um, the materials have elastic deformation behavior and plastic deformation behavior, and it depends on the um, crystalline microstructure of the material. Um, we have, uh, in, in generally, in all metallic materials, we have a crystalline structure, and when it is the lattice is just elastically deformed, it can spring back to its original position. So we call it elastic deformation, and when it uh, cannot the slip planes activate the um, atoms permanently move their positions, we call it plastic deformation. So depending on the crystal structure, plastic deformation in metal takes place by a process of slip on certain crystal planes under the action of shear stress, which is applied. The slip planes are those of uh, greatest atomic packing and slip across slip planes occurs in specific directions, namely the lines of greatest, greatest atomic density. So this is the basics of our uh, fundamentals of uh, plastic deformation or plastic science. So what happens is that based on different crystal structures, there are different uh, fully packed uh, planes which are more prone to deformation when um, uh, shear stress is applied along them. For example, here in this slide, you will see that um, for um, body centered cubic crystal structures, there are different slip planes which are more prone to activation. In um, FCC crystal structures, uh, one by one plane is the mo most prone to uh, uh, slip plane activation, and in HCP, um, the value is completely different. Um, as the slip planes are the planes with the highest density of atoms, uh, slip planes are unique to the lattice which they are present, and these are also vital for deformation of the material that occurs. Um, the application of shear along the length of an object causes the slip lattice to glide along each, and uh, therefore um, slip takes place. Now. Um, the crystal of an atom can be randomly oriented based on how the load is applied. So there is a certain angle of uh, the slip system uh, which is more prone to activation and then it is also oriented um, along a certain direction with respect to the load which we are applying. So therefore there is a um, in the in the basics of crystal plasticity what we do is um, we use critical result shear stress uh, uh, or Schmidt's law to identify the uh, the amount of applied load and how that is resolved for a specific uh, slip plane and if it is greater than the um, resolved shear stress or it, the, the resolved shear stress is greater than the critical resolved shear stress uh, out of that certain plane, then the material will deform, otherwise it will not deform. So it is a very simple equation on um, how the uh, stress is applied and then versus the cause of uh, slip plane normal to and the cause of slip direction. And based on that, we can always uh, resolve it to identify the resolved shear stress and then how it is compared with the critical resolved shear stress. Um, Generally, um, the resolved shear stress is uh, a maximum if a cubic crystal is oriented at 45 degree to the loading axis because at that angle um, uh, the slip plane uh, will be fully aligned with the load which will apply and it will be minimum if the orientation is 0 degrees or 90 degrees. So, um, yeah, um, then uh, the resolved shear stress will be very, very um, um, high as compared to the critical resolved shear stress. For the deformation to take place, applied resolved shear stress must be greater than the critical resolved shear stress. And the critical resolved shear stress depends on crystal type, solid solution, strengthening, and uh, temperature. So, this is just a general overview of um, how we are resolving the overall load on a specific local um, grain or an element. Now, uh, when we go further, uh, what we have understood so far is that metals have crystalline structure, um, okay, and the plastic deformation in crystalline structure takes place due to distribution glide. And uh, 
this dislocation, uh, the happening of this dislocation glide uh, for some crestline planes, they are more prone to dislocation glide than others. Uh, these are called slip planes and the deformation occurs in those, um, in, in those slip planes. For the deformation to take place, a light resolved shear stress must be greater than the least critical resolved shear stress for a certain slip plane on a certain direction. Um, now, another important uh, component which comes in is hardening, and hardening takes place due to uh, dislocation pinning error and reduction in mean free path. So, we somehow also have to accommodate how once a slip plane has activated and energy, a certain amount of energy has been absorbed then at what limit does uh, it stop? In actual materials, it takes space due to distribution pinning and uh, mean free path reduction. Now, the, now this, this is generally when we are talking about only one crystal, but in overall materials, we have polycrystalline microstructures. So that means there are several grains with different orientations aligned very differently with uh, the loading axis. And the problem becomes more complicated with polycrystalline microstructures because we have to solve this equation for every um, small element and, and get our answers. To solve such problems, we define the model for crystal plasticity and make all these calculations. So these are basically all the fundamentals for um, crystal plasticity. And how do we do this is by this not so complicated math. So um, I still cannot open my, uh, I still cannot open my um, uh, pointer, but yeah, the, or let me try, uh, I don't know, let me try, or can leave it. Uh, the deformation uh, gradient is dependent on the two components, the elastic component and the plastic component. And um, calculating the elastic component is simple. The elastic component uh, is depending on the uh, pure luggage of stress which we apply and the uh, elastic stiffness matrix of the material. Um, this elastic stiffness matrix is basically um, um, just uh, a, a matrix which, which defines all the elastic stiffness tensors, elastic stiffnesses in all the nine directions of a crystal. And um, so we get this uh, elastic deformation component from this simple equation. And on the other hand, uh, the plastic deformation um, uh, component uh, can be divided into uh, plastic velocity gradient and uh, plastic deformation rate. Now, this plastic, uh, plastic velocity gradient is basically defined by a very simple equation of uh, shear rate. Uh, multiplied by uh, the no normal to slip plane and uh, slip direction on every uh, slip plane. So alpha is basically slip systems, which are from one to n, depending on the crystal um, crystal structure we have. We will basically calculate this uh, plastic velocity gradient for every um, slip plane, and then we will see how much is the and then we will sum them up, and we will see how much is the total plastic velocity gradient. Now this, um, now this shear rate is depending on the reference shear, which is basically the initial, um, we can say in this phenomenological model, we can say this is the um, reference shear or the yield point of the material. And then we talk about um, how it is connected with the resolved shear stresses, the strain component, and uh, slip resistance. Now this uh, strain rate exponent is basically just a hardening uh, exponent, which is in this phenomenological model a uh, fitting uh, parameter. And the other hand, this hardening is defined by this uh, slightly um, complicated uh, method where we have a slip resistance. Um, depending on the shear rate, the hardening matrix which is basically how the two slip systems are interacting with each other, uh, as well as the uh, saturation of the slip resistances, which is the maximum how much uh, a slip resistance can saturate to. Um, and in the end, the latent hardening coefficient, which is generally defined as one. It also depends on the fitting parameter for the hardening, which basically controls how um, this ratio between uh, the, the slip resistance and the saturation slip is. 
affected. Now, all this is uh, basically um, a set of equations which is solved for every uh, unique point. And then by summing up the whole uh, system, we can get a result for our whole big case. Uh, and this is only a model for uh, the phenomenological case, which is relatively simpler. Then in Damask, it is, uh, there are also several other isotropic uh, homogeneous models built in. There are also physics-based trick models built in. So what they do is basically this deformation gradient is then further divided into um, the elastic and plastic part, and then plastic part is further divided into um, the overall deformation based on the twin systems, the transformation system, the distribution glide, and so on and so on. But this is relatively the basic form. Um, now, using these models, um, the objective of our work is to develop a robust numerical model for multiphase um, steels or different materials, which are based on real physical microstructural properties, which are flexible for modeling singular multiphase materials, which are depending on the composition. Uh, which are depending on the grain orientation. Um, we want to have models that can be processed to obtain um, information as well as phase, uh, phase transformation uh, and damage behavior if necessary. Um, and depending on the detailed problem definition, uh, we also want to know uh, more local details about the phase distribution damage evolution, strains, stresses, twinning or transformation, and other local attributes of interest such as orientation change and so on. So the overall objective of our work um, here, or my work here, was microstructural informed crystal plasticity based full phase modeling of with damage to obtain global and local results. And that is what we are trying to do here. Now the methodology of the work is generally so that once we are defining a problem uh, um, at, a, at a large scale, we are using a spectral solver to, uh, to deform and develop boundary conditions. When we are doing this, that boundary condition and uh, is basically resolved for each, uh, for the whole component as deformation partitioning and based on the homogenization scheme which we have applied. And then that based on the, that homogenization scheme, um, all the attributes are then divided on every individual uh, element or component in the, our representative volume element, which we will quickly talk about in the later slide. But here I just want to give a breakdown of uh, how the big problem is being divided down to a relatively local scale and the vice versa. And once we are dividing that it is then being further subdivided into all the individual deformation uh, constitutive laws uh, which govern the overall deformation behavior. We solve them for every individual element one by one and that this information is uh, overall uh, averaged out for the um, elastoplastic overall uh, elemental part and it is further uh, given upwards to uh, the overall component scale and then we give uh, and then we get an output which can be may be written out. Now, all these uh, are basically the overall um, algorithmic scales which the simulation works with, but generally we deal with only three files, the geometry file, load file, and material configuration file, and I will quickly talk about them one by one. Now, in the geometry file, what we do is we define um, a geometry with uh, a grid and a uh, a homogenization scheme and then the size of it. The size does not really matter. It only um, affects the overall outlook of how the geometry will look like, but the grid and then the corresponding uh, elements too. So here, for example, I have defined a very simple geometry of two by two by two, which means two pixels, or two voxels in x direction, two voxels in y direction, and two in z direction. And just to clearly give an idea of how this, okay, I'm defining this geometry, I will start from the left bottom corner. So here 1, 2, 2, 1 means uh, left bottom corner, then 1, 2, and then again uh, the top uh, left corner to 1. And then once the, this x phase of geometry is complete, then we go in the next direction and then we define it again. So this is basically a cube which is defined like this. And then uh, the second file is the load file in which we want to apply um, deformation. 
and in this case we define it uh, the we define the load file by dividing it in uh, deformation rate the stress tensor and based on the time for which we want to apply this the increments and overall frequency with which we want to save the data set so uh, in this case uh, i am define i am applying uh, load in only in x direction therefore uh, I am defining a deformation rate, quasi-static deformation rate of 1 into 10 is to power minus 3, which is defined here in the um, x, x coordinate. And then the other ones are complementary conditions, which are represented here by static. And the zeros depict basically a fixed condition. The time basically defines for how many increments. The time basically defines for how much um, total strain. Uh, because it is deformation rate, so the time basically defines how much total deformation there will be, and increments define how much is this time uh, total deformation further divided into every increment. So um, yeah, this is just basically simple like any other finite element tool, uh, these boundary conditions, and then we come towards the material configuration file, which is uh, which consists of several uh, um, components. Which are um, which define the overall material. Uh, it is uh, it defines how the global deformation rate is applied at the local scale for every element. And then uh, we talk details about the microstructure, the respective texture and phase information for each individual solution. Point is defined here. This microstructure is basically fed by the texture and phase information, which is also written in the uh, material configuration file. And in the end, we define a crystalline uh, section with all the necessary outputs we want. So in the material configuration file, basically uh, based on the, uh, I'll have to go back. So based on the geometry file here, when we say here one, two, and Two or one for example here there are only two voxels one and two so simulation wants to know what is one and what is two and to define this one and two what we do is we define all them in the material configuration file um, uh, as a microstructure and then based on that microstructure we define one is this phase and this um, orientation distribution and two is this phase and this orientation distribution. They can be same, generally they are different. And based on that, the simulation knows which attributes, which deformation principles and laws to be constitutive laws should be attributed to which um, um, element and then how they need to be solved and resolved. So generally, um, uh, summing up, uh, all that we have uh, an RVE as you can see on the left side um, it is basically how the material microstructure will look like it is divided in very small uh, parts and each part we are calling it here a voxel or you can call it a mesh element or a solution point um, is basically divided into uh, different components. So we define elastic tensor, we define phase fractions of it, defect dynamics, crystal dynamics, orientation and homogenization. We define all these things for each solution point based on the homogenization scheme. The overall load is divided on that and then the computer tries to solve the, the basic equations of the crystal plasticity to find out what is the overall um, deformation uh, gradient or the uh, deformation in, the, in that element so on until it is that it is able to fully solve this solution um, is in equilibrium state and then it basically writes the output. So yeah, when when I so that is basically how it, it, it works. And when I look at the methodology of how we can use these models to overall uh, go on um, de developing different models for uh, materials, what we can do here is. I have shown here the general methodology of how we go by using these crystal plasticity models for um, yeah, um, understanding or engineering different materials. So what in the beginning we do is uh, we adopt a damask uh, model. Um, we use um, we use a small RVE to uh, do the parameter parametric identification and calibration. This is something which Maybe if you're interested, we can discuss later, but it generally is um, about how these, um, the 
parameters which we talked about, the fitting parameters or the um, critical shear stress and so on, how they can be identified for each material. We do that here and then uh, we collect the microstructural data. Uh, it can be from literature, it can be from EBS DMI events, it can be from um, XRD DMI events and so on. So we want to know about what is what is the what is the overall microstructure of the material uh, we, uh, we are trying to model. Um, based on that, we develop um, representative volume elements and we run simulations with varying compositions and loading conditions. Um, if interested, we can also add print ductile or printed damage criteria in the model. And um, in the end, we have a full phase simulations for, uh, we can run full phase simulations for multi-phase materials with damage. And that is something which we will talk about in the, in the, in the presentation next. Um, for example, in the first example, I will talk about the parametric calibration and comparison of average results for changing um, loading conditions. So here was um, uh, using a physics-based model in Damas. So that is slightly more complicated than the phenomenological-based model which I talked about, um, which will be used in another example later. But here, for example, what we are doing is we are taking a very small RVE. So you will see here that it is uh, only a 10 by 10 by 10 um, um, sized RVE with not so many um, resolved grains. But uh, when we tested it, we realized that it gives quite nice results, um, quite nice global results, not not the local results. So what I did here was initially I did the parametric uh, analysis by changing all the different parameters in my material model, looking at how they um, affect the overall behavior of the material. Then um, based on the experimental observations, what I did was I calibrated all these parameters for my material, which was 1676 strip T. Um, and, um, and then what we did was uh, we uh, ran the simulations on the same small scale RVE for the tensile and compressive direction, and we can see the results in the um, in the right hand graphs. So what we observe here is that uh, uh, the energy absorption in the material is higher under tensile load as compared to the compressive load. First of all, if I will um, show you here, because we calibrated the data quite well, you will see that the solid line here represents the experimental observations, and then the dotted lines and then uh, uh, shows the overall uh, tensile simulation results. They match quite well. And um, on the lower side, the red lines are indicating the overall uh, transformation behavior of the material. Because in our case, in this material, uh, there is a phase transformation from metastable austenite to martensite. And that is something which you were more interested in modeling. And we also try to uh, yeah, calibrate our model based on that. So yeah, you will see that uh, the results uh, the results are yeah um, close to uh, our experimental observations. But when we apply load in compressive direction, we see that there is uh, less uh, strain hardening in the material, so relatively less energy absorption, as well as there is less transformation in the material. And what we can do is because these models are quite detailed and are depending on all the individual uh, phenomena, what we can do is we can uh, divide it into all these subsections and look at how uh, the material is behaving. So the top graph shows the hardening behavior of the material, where uh, you will see that the hardening quickly drops uh, in from the elastic range to the plastic range, and then it is almost constant in the actual experiments. And the, uh, in the compression case, we will see that uh, the hardening is almost similar up to 10, 12 percent but then it starts to relatively drop as compared to the uh, as compared to the experiments and in the tensile case it is almost similar to the observations up to 30% and then, and then it starts to increase and why is that it is because it is shown in the lower graph here that there is significantly high amount of uh, phase transformation in this um, in, in, in our material and this high phase transformation restricts the mean free path of dislocations which can move and because of this there is high uh, dislocation density uh, increase in the tensile case and therefore there is higher hardening and while on the other hand when there is low transformation there is less 
dislocation density increase and therefore the material remains softer and continues to deform. So yeah, um, the, uh, the, the problem with this kind of model was that, um, that um, the simulation just continues to run because there is because in the actual materials there is damage and uh, and uh, stiffness degradation in the material but in this case there wasn't any so what we did in the later stages was we developed a full phase simulation model of drip steel and zirconia particles and then compared uh, the results with the local results so in this case you will see that i developed a virtually constructed microstructure using uh, green 3d uh, the composition is 10 percent uh, zirconia particles you can see in this phase map so this blue is the matrix and the red are particles and um, and on the other side you can see that the, uh, the ipf color map showing the orientation distributions um, in this case as well it is austenite and uh, zirconia particles the austenite was assigned uh, distribution and transformation and tuning based crystal plasticity material model to tactile damage criteria and the zirconia particles were assigned to damage criteria based on the critical strength energy what we do is we apply tensile uh, load and uh, the rv stresses along the x direction and reduces along the y direction um, what if you look at the global results of this study um, we see that um, let's take a look at this blue stress strain curve first we see that the stress strain uh, curve is relatively similar to what we also experimentally but because there were relatively larger zirconia particles so once there is uh, cracking in them which starts at as low as seven percent of the strain um, we see several kinks in the uh, in the stress strain curve and at higher strain regimes um, there is a stiffness degradation due to uh, damage in the austenite matrix and therefore the damage curve uh, significantly drops it starts at six percent but significantly drops up to 16 percent and uh, on the other hand we see that the dislocation density continues to increase um, and uh, saturates and on the other hand uh, we see that the phase transformation is also continuously increased now in this case we were interested in looking at the uh, damage initiation and uh, propagation behavior so we see here that damage initiated along the weak links between the zirconia particles and also on the interface of the zirconia um, uh, zirconia particles and austenite matrix at 9.6 percent of the strain um, we see this uh, image and uh, then at higher strains for example at 13.3 percent uh, we see that the stress in the material is still increasing uh, the interface decohesion continues to grow there are more zirconia particles uh, which are tracking and void nucleation at the triple points and the material also uh, uh, yeah, uh, starts to grow and at even higher uh, strains at 16.2 percent strains we see that there is then stress relaxation so the stress drops from 480 megapascals to 450 megapascals because there is overall material stiffness degradation and then we see yeah enhanced material damage and the zirconia particles as well as the austenite matrix now if i compare this uh, trend with the experimental observations which were published before we see that in other publications it was shown that uh, in the left figures you will see the zirconia particles at the initial state and in the, uh, and in the um, uh, right figures you will see the zirconia particles and the austenite matrix around them at the final stages and we see that um, it was also reported that around 440 mpa uh, strain was not precisely reported but at the overall stress of 440 mpa it is observed that there is um, interface decohesion around the zirconia particles as well as there is uh, brittle cracking of the zirconia particles perpendicular to the applied load and when we compare these with the overall um, observations in our case we see we observe the similar trends that the zirconia particles crack almost perpendicular to the loading direction and there is interface decohesion about around 45 degree to the loading axis so we know that the calibrated material model parameters are not only accurate at the global scales but also uh, depict the overall deformation and damage behavior of the materials at local scales for multi-phase uh, for multi-phase complex material cases and that was quite interesting for us now the advantage of simulations is that we can also post process the data uh, uh, 
in, in quite detail and observe um, and, and get more information. For example, here in this case, I uh, what I did was I analyzed and compared the behavior of two areas from the same RVE and looked at how um, one interlocked region and the other relatively free region uh, behave under the same applied load. And we can see the difference here in, the, uh, in this uh, graph shown below on the bottom right corner. We see that there is the stress strain behavior of the overall material is same up to 16%, 18% uh, strain, but we see that there is significant high amount of damage in interlocked region and there is very less damage which also initiates at a very late stage in the free regions. The distribution density uh, in the interlocked region is relatively higher as well as the, the transformation in the uh, interlocked region is significantly higher in the austenite matrix. So we can do this. We can also uh, plot uh, line graphs. Uh, to see how the uh, how the orientation distribution uh, affects the overall deformation behavior in the free regions as well as in the interlocked regions, we see that with the change in grains, the solid lines here at the bottom show the grain boundaries. We see that there is no significant change in the stresses or strains, but in the interlocked regions, but in the but in the interlocked regions. We see that there is significant high amount of uh, damage uh, at uh, near the grain boundaries, um, and uh, because of that, there is significant high amount of strain, very low uh, or uh, resolved stresses. Um, so yeah, we can also so the the point of showing this is that we can um, uh, post process the data in many different ways and uh, can get all the details and yeah. Uh, go on. And now I will talk about the local strain measurements and multiphase materials with full phase uh, crystal plasticity simulations. In this example, uh, what we did was uh, we have this uh, material um, specifically uh, manufactured with three different phase, phase components. Uh, in the middle, you will see around um, ferrite uh, yeah, inclusion. Um, generally around all this blue is the austenite matrix and then we have uh, a very hard martensite phase present. On the grain orientation map scale you will see the overall orientation distribution 90F colors and here you see that the austenite grain is at 001 uh, orientation um, here. Um, what we, what, what we did here was we used this uh, we used this EBSD Meyer local area as a geometry file for our damask simulations. We applied 9% at tensile strain and then looked at the local strain measurements. On the other hand, this material was deformed in C2 in the electron microscope and several pictures were taken from the beginning to 9% strain and then using digital uh, image correlation tools a strain measurement was carried out and then uh, we can see the comparison between the predictions between simulations and prediction uh, and uh, the observation in the experiments uh, on the same scale we see that yeah the results are in the similar areas match quite well with the experimental observations qualitatively so where the where the strains are higher in experiments in simulations they are also higher where the strain means are lower in experiments the, the, uh, in simulations they are also relatively lower we will talk about the quantitative yeah comparisons later but let's talk about this relatively simple example of local deformation and damage behavior of solidized steels and in this case what we do is um, we manufacture a material by hot rolling um, and then cooling it to the room temperature, then doing spheralization heat treatment and then cold rolling again and then doing spheralization heat treatment. We want to do spheralization heat treatment up uh, two times and cold rolling in the middle to get this um, microstructure with relatively smaller grain size and with relatively homogeneous distribution of uh, second phase particles within. 
So after this process of what we did was we did a detailed analysis of uh, analyzing the microstructural behavior to see how our methodology worked. Um, and what we observed was that uh, the sedimentary particles are relatively homogeneously distributed. As you will see here, we have several small ferrite grains, but some relatively larger ferrite grains and um, the overall distribution or the orientation distribution is also neutral on the other side you will see that uh, the the aspect ratio of the ferrite grains is between one and two generally and the equivalent uh, radius of the grains is generally between one and five slightly a few grains are relatively larger um, between 5 and 10 micrometer um, equivalent diameter range but yeah so we have this relatively nice microstructure and we want to look at how it, it, it behaves so this was a very detailed study where we did all the experiments um, to carry it out to uh, to uh, to analyze the overall mechanical behavior, we did several in situ tests and, and so on. But in this case, I will focus on how we did it. Um, so, what I did was I used this uh, RVE as a geometry file directly to uh, be used with Damask. Um, ferrite were, was assigned the, uh, the uh, phenomenological model, and cementite particles are assigned the elastic. Uh, attributes only because they are relatively harder and have significantly high strength as compared to the ferrite matrix. So they were not really, um, yeah, uh, we assume that they are not really plastically deforming. And what we observe is, um, we observe that there is a relatively heterogeneous stress and strain distribution in our material. Relatively, not, not so high, but yeah, we see some grains have relatively higher stress and higher strain than the others. And we look at two areas where we have uh, cementite particles distributed along uh, different grains and uh, we see that when, the, when the grains are relatively aligned in the loading direction, uh, the stresses are lower and the strains are relatively higher. And on the other hand, uh, when there are several other grains with almost similar grain sizes, but uh, when the orientation, uh, when these grains are oriented in, yeah, uh, not in preferable directions. Uh, that is where the Schmidt law, which we discussed earlier, kicks in. And we see that there are relatively significantly higher stresses and relatively lower strains. And uh, there is stress concentration around the cementite particles. Again, we can also map how uh, the stresses and strains are changing across different grains in two different regions. Um, and we see that uh, when the uh, when the uh, grain is aligned at 45 degree to the loading axis. Um, for example, in the top uh, graph in three, in the beginning, we see that there is significantly, uh, uh, yeah, uh, in, in the middle, we see that there is significantly lower um, stress and also relatively is a higher strain. And on the other hand, uh, it, it, it is not the case. So yeah, we can post-process the results in different manners. And when we look at the damage initiation, we uh, see that it starts at around 9.5% of the strain and uh, around the zirconia, uh, around the cementite particles uh, at their interface. And it continues to grow uh, at uh, along uh, perpendicular to the grain boundaries. And at relatively higher strains, we see that these voids uh, join together and form relatively large micro cracks in the material. Uh, and yeah, uh, we see that uh, they coalesce and damage propagates in the 45 degree to the loading axis. So the damage initiation and their uh, coalescence and micro crack uh, propagation also uh, resembled our, yeah, matches the results quite well with what we observed experimentally. And uh, in the in the last example, what I would want to show you is um, um, how, what we did recently with uh, the in situ testing. So in our electron microscope, we have a possibility to do uh, in situ tests. That is something which I have uh, talked quite a lot um, in, uh, in, my, uh, in my presentation. So we have an in situ test stage. We use a small miniature dog bone sample, and uh, we look at the microstructure at the middle of the sample. Um, and then um, while we are loading the sample, we take incremental images. 
these images can uh, be uh, post-processed using uh, micro digital image correlation tool uh, weather, um to get uh, local strain measurements. And also, uh, what we did was we transformed this image to a geometry file uh, for Damask. In this case, we have, we have a matrix and particles, and uh, we, uh, we uh, run the Damask model with calibrated material parameters, which we have talked about, and we see that the, the experimental and simulation um, observations match quite well. And then we can compare, uh, we can also compare the local um, results uh, here. And for example, in this strain image, what we generally observe is that at the same scale, there is uh, the, the overall strain in the material is relatively more or less very similar. And you will see in the simulation images that uh, the, there are areas with a relatively significant high amount of strain, and that is because uh, damage is taking place here. If I overlay uh, the, the damage predictions in it, then we can compare our uh, experimental results with the simulation results. So all the other three images are from the simulations about the stresses, about the phase transformation and local strains, but only the top right image is from the experiments and now we can compare. For example, at point one, we will see that uh, it, the, the experiments uh, from experiments we observe a very large void forming at the edge of a zirconia particle, and we also observe a similar trend in our uh, simulations. On the other hand, we see that when um, there are uh, the aspect ratio of the zirconia particles is very uh, very low um, or very high, um, depending on how we are taking this ratio, we see that when, uh, when they are elongated, there is a void formation at the, at the edge of the zirconia particles. And we also see that in the, uh, in the experiments, simulations. Around the round uh, zirconia inclusions, there is very less uh, decohesion and damage, uh, but when the round inclusions are located in the close vicinity where the where there are interlocked regions, um, the damage initiates and uh, propagates. And these are all the trends which we observe similarly in our simulations and experiments. And in the end, we see that um, in, in experiments, we observe that there is a significantly large damage at some points, but in simulations, this damage is not so uh, pronounced. And on the other hand, we see that as damage is predicted by simulations in the middle of the sample, but in experiments, we don't see any damage there. So the general outcome from this was that we are running simulations in 2D, but rather the overall material deformation behavior in experiments is 3D. And the overall deformation behavior uh, it can be represented by this schematic diagram, which is shown here. So we can see some damage incidents on the surface. We see that there is a significant amount of stress relaxation on the surface due to the damage zones below the surfaces. There are very high strain peaks around the uh, around the inclusion particles on the surface, which is observed, but it is influenced by the overall um, damage zones below the surface. Um, the overall distribution of damage is 3D, so a void forms around the particle and not just on the surface. And the concentration of the damage zones in the matrix interlock between the hard particles. So yeah, the overall phenomenon is 3D and not really 2D. And um, yeah, that, 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 that is now what we are working on um, these days. So the overall conclusion of the talk is that the developed expertise and the model can be used and analyzed um, to, uh, to, to work with materials with varying compositions. Uh, for example, with rape group steels, uh, uh, magnesium alloys, aluminum alloys, and uh, advanced ferritic steels. Um, the varying microstructure uh, of the material can also be uh, simulated. For example, the DP steels and mechanically treated steels and spheroidized steels, which we saw in the example. And we can also uh, do um, simulations based on different loading conditions, such as uniaxial loading, multi directional loading or different degree of deformation. And in the top examples we saw when we changed the direction of, for example, from tension to compression, we see the um, results. So based on where we are now, the problems that can be taken up next uh, can be uh, running more full phase 3D simulations that we observe that um, they, uh, the overall material deformation behavior is 3D. 
and then comparing them with experiment observations for different materials and complicated cases. Um, recrystallization and, uh, res uh, and resolving phase transformation is not really part of the crystal plasticity models right now. So that requires coupling this crystal plasticity with phase field modeling and then um, combining them or running them in parallel to get these results. That is uh, currently missing, which can be useful application for high temperature uh, for high temperature deformation behaviors. Um, we also want to run more simulations to establish structured property relationships. So we want to develop process maps based on the material microstructural changes, and um, we want to use machine learning to uh, engineering application to engineering uh, application oriented materials. So these are the challenges which in the future we are working with. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I know it was um, very long, but yeah, I wanted to cover all the aspects and all the examples and everything. So yeah, thank you very much. And now we can talk about it. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Faisal. Uh, very interesting uh, content. Uh, some uh, of the content are um, very complicated, still very complicated for us, yeah, mm. because we are still new. But I'm very interested in this um, in situ, yeah? in situ test stage. Yeah? Mm. The basically the in situ test stage, you are investigating only 2D, yeah. Um, of course. So the, the issue with in situ is that um, when the sample is in the test stage, we are only looking at the surface. So surface, yeah. overall material deformation is 3D. So the material is basically in the in the bulk deformation mode, but we are only observing the surface. So we only know what are the stresses or strains on the surface. And the oh no, not only not the, the only the strains uh, how they how they are on the surface. Okay, this uh, the the result the result this one is um, uh, in the normal temperature, yeah, in the 20 degree temperature, yeah. Yes, but we also have a hot plate, so we can also do the same tests at higher temperatures. Ah, oh, you can use also. But for now, we only did at room temperature. Okay, so the result is quite good, yeah. Actually, yeah, the I mean the experimental stress and then the simulation stress are quite uh, overlap to each other, yeah. Strains, yes, but they. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, th the issue is that uh, these results are very much dependent on, for example, how we set up the test, what are the contrasts in the pictures which we take, then how we set up our digital image correlation tool, and then based on the movement of pixels, I'm sure you will be familiar with digital image correlation. So based on that, we we get the local strain measurements on the surface. So it depends on many assumptions there. And then, of course, in the crystal plasticity models, it, it depends on the several assumptions there. But based on all these assumptions and all the generalizations which we did, and yeah, it is, it is, yeah, significantly tricky thing. But we could show that the results are very much comparable. And uh, the strain is how much is the strain? I mean, I mean, the stress you you pull, you do the tensile. Mm -hmm. how, how high is the is the stress? Depends depends on the material. So generally, in our cases, it is around uh, at, at higher levels. It is around, as you can see here, around 500 megapascals. Okay. So, but but depends on the material. If the material will be softer, it will be significantly lower. If the material will be even stronger, it can go higher. Mm -hmm. So basically, by having this uh, crystal plasticity, can we actually uh, uh, predict the 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 breaking the breaking of the of the stress and strain can you can can we can we simulate the the breaking of the of the uh, uh, the the behavior here because we have here mm -hmm. we have here a linear uh, elastic plastic and then the breaking can we can we actually analyze that yeah so for example in this case um, or let me go back further in the case of um, yeah, so in this example, what we saw was, if I will go back to these global results, yeah, here. So for example, we can see that uh, based on if we have a calibrated simulation 
crystal plasticity model with um, a relatively uh, calibrated uh, damage criteria for all the phases which are present in. Yeah, we can see how uh, the stiffness degradation in the material is taking place and how damage is evolving. For example, as you can see in this slide. Um, so, so, but, but, but the thing is that all these parameters are depending on the, on the initially for calibration are depending on the experiments. So we need some reference data to uh, to make sure that our simulation models are calibrated and they are predicting the material behavior quite accurately. And then, of course, we can change the geometry, the loading conditions, and so on and so on to see how and and why that behavior will be different from. I hope and um, from the other materials. I hope that is understandable. Should we simply write uh, the subroutine, or how is it uh, in the Damas? In Damas, you have also this kind of uh, uh, this algorithm, or we should add uh, our mm -hmm. own subroutine for that? For for damage? Yeah, for damage. Um, there are already two damage models available with Damas. Okay. So. Um, very simple ones, the tile damage criteria based on um, uh, maximum principal strain and uh, br brittle damage criteria based on uh, plastic strain energy. So by adjusting, uh, and, and they are already there, so it just needs to be referred to with all the values given as input and then it, it, it basically runs out to a subroutine which is already there and then the solution comes back. Okay. So yeah. Okay. What do you mean uh, on the full face simulations? Actually, yeah. What is actually the full face? What is the meaning? What What do you mean on the full face? By full face, we mean when the phases are uh, fully resolved. Uh, for example, in this case. Yeah. So it can either be a case where I can use a very small RVE with yeah. the right composition. Yeah. of zirconia and uh, austenite, uh, but it is not individual phases, it is just a mix of both phases and the simulation just runs all these equations and gives us the global output. Yeah. But when I talk about the full phase, I mean each individual phase and each individual grain is fully resolved in a way that the results are local and can be assigned to every yeah, phase and grain and they can be separated out later. So that is basically full phase simulation. Is it is it is it clear? Uh, no, no, no. It's, uh, or for uh, example, if yeah. I will if I will show you this example. So here in this case, this is not a full phase simulation, where mm -hmm. we had a very small RVE, and we, and when we solve all these equations for this small RVE, the global results are. Uh, yeah, what we can see in this slide. But if you want me, uh, if you want me to point out which voxel or which crane had highest stresses or lowest stresses and why, I cannot really point that out because, yeah, the, there is no individual grain or phase here. So you mean that full phase meaning in each voxel you will uh, assign the properties in each voxel. Yes, but then on the other, the resolution is relatively higher that each grain and uh, and and phase can be individually separated out like, yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. So that's what I'm calling full phase simulations where they are resolved to, uh, the resolution is resolved to a phase level. The resolution is resolved into the phase level, yeah? Yeah, so we can identify between two different phases. And then of course at that scale, we also have different grains and then different orientations. So based on them, the results in each, yeah, voxel or in grain each, will change. In each voxel, yeah? Yeah. So the, the computational time will be also longer, yeah? Logically. Of or, course. Okay. Okay, Isa, do you have any, any questions, Isa? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Mr. President, thank you for your presentation. 
Uh, okay, uh, I would like to ask uh, about, I'm interested on the, when we say about calibration. Uh, so calibration now, we are using uh, experimentation data as our reference, am I right? To compare hmm. with our simulation. So, yeah. is, is, do, do we have like uh, international library that every researcher uh, refer to that one source or how? Hmm. It is it is it is tricky. So there. So what? So what? Um, what people at MDIE who developed Damask did was that they initially developed sort of a documentation. So they also adopted these um, basic crystal plasticity models from other researchers and then um, adjusted them in a way that they can be written in a script. Uh, yeah, so for that, basically they had to maybe um, modify the models and the assumptions and the equations. And then for that system specifically, they developed these um, documentations. So in their very early articles, they also talk about uh, what these uh, each individual parameters are and what they are actually significant or what they are doing. For that you can look at their very early um, very early work of Franz Rotters um, or Martin Diehl and then from there now basically a lot of people are using them so what they are doing is they are building on them where they are publishing for example we calibrated our material model um, for this specific material with this chemical composition and the parameters which we used or uh, the fitting uh, the physical or the fitting parameters which we used are these so you can already go in that narrow range but when we are when we are um, uh, defining materials at this small meso scale the problem is that with with the slight change in uh, the chemical composition or the or the manufacturing process, the overall attributes change. Why? Because there are several um, interstitial uh, elements, for example, carbon, nitrogen, and so on, um, which can affect the overall material deformation behavior, as well as there are um, substitutional elements for um, the microalloyed elements or so on, which can also affect the overall deformation behavior. But they are never written individually in any equation or so. So therefore, these fitting parameters or the physical parameters, for example, uh, the critical resolved shear stress um, or, um, or the saturation stress, they always need to be adjusted a little based on the material we have. So you can always narrow down to, for example, if there is majorly ferrite in your case, you can always get attributes for ferrite, but then they will not be perfect for maybe your material because the chemical composition or the manufacturing process route is slightly different and then you will need to adjust these parameters and yeah, then use it. I see, alright. Uh, so what, what uh, I get from, from your answer is uh, for Crystal Pacity FEM, they, there are several group of researchers doing the same thing but they have different uh, convention Maybe maybe in Damas group mm. you have your own model, mm. uh, mathematical model that you uh, you say that this this uh, parameter is significant. Some of researchers said that maybe this is not too significant, and also mm. in terms of your material also you have uh, different slightly different I think, but generally I think uh, we can uh, unify them. In like uh, simplified uh, version. So, so mm. I, 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 I get it, your, your answer. So, mm. right. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, one more thing. Can you get to your slide? Can you go to, to, to the uh, stress and strain graph for Zirconia just now? Uh, uh, can you go, I think, forward, going forward? It was this one? Uh, the one that they do the blue and the red uh, graph for zircon. I, I want to see the zircon tracking. But mm -hmm. zircon tracking, yeah, this yeah. one zircon particle tracking. So this graph is taken from simulation or the actual. Uh, no, it is. It is completely from simulations. There is no experiment from, here. From 
simulation so simulation also can pick up the zip code and particle cracking eh? from, from means that from your your uh, mathematical model you are able to detect this phenomenon yeah, so so it is basically depending on I will I have shown it here so at the bottom uh, corner you will see that the bot the bottom with brittle damage criteria the critical strength was for the zirconia particles of set at 1200 megajoules so basically this drives the when the zirconia particles will crack and therefore yeah we when the zirconia particles are cracking there is slight uh, drop in yeah, stress relaxation and that is ah, yeah, visible okay. as a kink here because the, the crack is like a brittle uh, behavior right so that's why it is yes. uh, i see then and you pick up again through uh, plasticity of uh, your your steel yeah so that then, uh, basically the elements where the that criteria is achieved they, uh, they their stress relaxation occurs but the rest uh, of the material is just continued just continues to deform is zirconia particle cracking is the crack by intragranular or uh, intra so here basically it, it does not stay uh, if, so actually there is a uh, uh, intragranular but but here in this case um, we are not there is no grain interface or grain boundary actually defined so here in this case it is considering which elements uh, in the our simulation model uh, satisfy the damage criteria which was defined and uh -huh. therefore cracking is taking place there. I see, so means your simulation does not consider any interaction between your grain boundary? No. Oh, for now, for now, no. Uh -huh. So you will only consider for single grain? And yeah, but, but, then, but then when the uh -huh. grain is changing, basically we assume that there is a perfect boundary between two elements so full stresses and the uh, the resolve so the, based on the homogenization the the overall boundary conditions and the uh, and the equilibrium condition can be fully transformed from one element to another without any consideration of the grain boundary here i see uh, no wonder when when i look at the, the, the uh, result then from from your uh, rde you have you have two two kind of uh, one is phase uh, mm -hmm. and Asana, and another one is uh, using your Boronoi, right? Mm -hmm. So these two uh, two D R D E you just overlap them, am I right? Mm -hmm. You just overlap them and you run the simulation. So it does not uh, consider great. Uh, Interaction between grain boundary, I think it should be no problem if, if you just. So why 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 do you need to overlay the the two RDE? Um, sorry, once again. Sorry. Uh, which two RVEs? Uh, IBF map and also your face map. You mm. have you have generated two D geometry file. One is IBF map, one is face map. Mm. Then do, do you over over overlap them? Into become one. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So basically, it is uh -huh. it is one RVE, but here I just show them. Uh, you just separate them. In, 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 yeah, I just show separate them. The oh, I just for oh. yeah, just to uh, clearly present all the data which is within this RVE. Right. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Faisal, the the. The voxel represents the grain or, or, or not actually? It can, if the uh, it is it is um, the voxel is basically a small piece. So it is basically finite element yeah. where we are breaking one big grain into small components, okay. where we, which we are calling solution points or voxels, and it can represent one grain if the resolution is very low yeah do you understand that but it, a grain can also comprise of several voxels which have the same orientation distribution same phase same attributes assigned to them so then it would be just be a one big grain so like in, we can see in the slide in your in your case here mm -hmm. uh, in this picture here 
uh, do you have actually uh, a lot of grains, isn't it? Yes. So, and your foxel is thousand. It is ten thousand. So it is hundred voxels in x direction, hundred in y direction. In this case. Okay, it means that ten thousand, yeah. So it can be that uh, one grain can have more voxels. Yes. So here we see, for example, one grain. Let's say the one orange in the middle mm -hmm. has many voxels associated to it. We can call it one grain because all these voxels have same orientation distribution and same phase distribution. Ah, this one in one. Ah, that's why the the shape is like this, yeah. Yeah. So we can call it one grain. We can call this another grain. Call this another grain, but yeah. But the simulation is not really aware of this one grain. It basically divides it in small components and then solves all these equations for each individual component. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it means uh, the damage criteria, if it exceeds mm -hmm. the criteria, will the voxels uh, separate or is it not the case? No. So it is a um, uh, continuum mechanics based case. So what happens is that um, there is an external damage criteria. Uh, the simulation basically exports the uh, stress and deformation uh, tensors out to that damage criteria and then based on the criteria which you have defined, some based on if, if they are met, those pixels get a stiffness degradation uh, value which means that now their stiffness will be reduced to a certain amount based on what is the uh, coefficient of stiffness degradation defined in those damage criteria. No? And then based on that, uh, the voxels will remain there, but they will not be able to carry out any further stiffness. Um, the problem with these kind of models is that then we have very large strains in those voxels and very low stress in those voxels, mm -hmm. but they will remain there. So there is no element deletion in the process. So uh, this, it is still a continuum and the boundary conditions uh, based on the homogenization scheme can still be um, passed through these voxels to other um, yeah, solution points. Is there any example on the stiffness degradations in the Damas website? Uh, none that I know of. But they have this uh, explanation in uh, Pratik Natraj article who worked on these damage models and how they were incorporated in the uh, Damask. So in those publications, they have all this detailed uh, behavior, uh, explanation of the brittle and tactile damage criteria, how they are developed, what are the parameters about. Wait, where is it? And where, then where, is they is where is it? Sorry, hmm? where is it? Which, which journal? It is, it is uh, Pratik Chantraj article. There are main articles about that let me see if I can find uh, on the um, yeah so it is I will copy this to chat. So it is one is this article. Okay. Uh, uh, then there are others. One is this article, which is also quite interesting. Okay. And then this is the article for the brittle criterion. So here, um, in these articles, they explain the damage in quite detail. Okay. So there is no separations of element and so on, yeah? It is just uh, with, uh, on the stiffness degradations, yeah, you mean, yeah? Uh, yes. Okay, if you, if you can show the page 39, please. Um, 39? Yeah. Uh, wait, let me, let me close this. I want to discard this and what I will do 
this, I will move this here. And we can go down. Oh, why is this not... I think we have to okay. in, invite Faisal to come to Malaysia to do a workshop three days. Yeah. When are you going back to? <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. It is basically. It is basically a very um, yeah tricky thing. But but yeah. Um, but in any case, let's. Um, it was thirty nine. Yes, thirty nine. Yes, yeah. 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 This one. This is actually the damage initiations, right? It is yes. not. It is not the stiffness uh, degradation. So we are not talking on the stiffness degradations on this example, right? Of course, because of this damage, there will be stiffness degradation automatically. Yeah. yeah but, but but here it is not shown. It is. Just, it is. Just, yes. Okay. And this one is. Uh, you are using also your uh, the damas, yeah. Yes. So it can also uh, simulate uh, this kind of the uh, propagations. It it can, but we are not sure up to which strain these propagations are accurate. So that is what we are working on now, and we also know that in case of 2D, these propagations are very narrow lines, channels at 45 degree to the rooting axis, which you are looking at here. We know that initiation is yeah nicely captured by the mask, but propagation is yeah is 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 dependent on several factors. So the the damage initiation principles and damage propagation principles both are fundamentally very different, um, and they have also have different mathematical backgrounds. But what we are doing here is we are just yeah. Um, Trying to show that in 2D this can also be done. Mm -hmm. So here we see that the damage initiates at different points, and then at larger strains, those points uh, combine together, um, and uh, yeah, form micro cracks. So you think that we don't need this kind of the damage initiations and propagation if we would like to simulate the uh, the stress strain response with this uh, stiffness deg degradations. We don't need this one, yeah. Yeah, of course it, it cannot it doesn't have to be fully resolved. It can be a very simple model which can also predict the same behavior. Yeah, I mean But if we want to see for example here we were more interested in looking at where does damage initiate and what is the effect of these small spheroidized particles when they are on the grain boundaries, so when they're in the middle of the grain, so when they're larger, when they're small. Mm -hmm. So we ran for example here we ran full phase simulations where these all Everything, all the features are fully resolved, and we could see how the damage is initiating and evolving around them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, Andreas, do you have any? Yes. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Fazal. Um, I have a question about uh, Schoner about um, attempting to create the virtual laboratory, mm -hmm. and you are taking uh, the 2D. Um, picture of the like EBSD and then you overlap mm -hmm. it and mm -hmm. later in the shuttle you have a 3D RBE. How do you go mm -hmm. from 2D to 3D? Ooh. Um, when we have a picture we are only constructing 2D um, uh, micrographs. Yes, correct. So, so, or, or the geometries. We are not actually constructing 3d geometry so the script which we have and we what we do is we cannot we or we have not done that yet um, for 3d rves what we are usually doing is we are collecting microstructural data let's say the grain size and um, the percentage composition and so on and then what we are generally doing is we are using dream 3d to construct those microstructures virtual microstructures for us so the the overall microstructural features that resemble 
what we have uh, in actual material, but they are not specifically that picture converted into a micrograph. So, so these mean, are two different. So these are two different schemes of constructing RBEs. It means in your uh, journal virtual laboratory, laboratory actually you mm -hmm. use the 2D uh, data, and then mm -hmm. you you build a 3D based on the 2D uh, properties. Is it like that? No, 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 no. In, in, we use 2D to construct 2D. Um, as far as I remember, but I will have to specifically know. Um, uh, are you using ODF? But I uh, just remember something from your people. Mm -hmm. uh, the function, what is ODF function? Mm -hmm. Yeah, where mm -hmm. basically you just, uh, I think from the 2D, you want to like uh, extrapolate into the dimension, uh, use like a function to just uh, do the 3D. Mm -hmm. Is that the... Yeah, 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 yeah. It, 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 it can be done. So, uh, so it, it is possible, yeah. but, but, uh, but when we are using a... But when we are using an image or a picture, generally we are only converting it into 2D, RVE. And can be converted into 3D by using orientation distribution function and several assumptions, but we didn't do that there. Okay, okay. And ODF, you, you got it from where, ODF, uh, Vaisa? So orientation distribution function can be obtained by um, different uh, methods. It can be obtained by um, using uh, EBSD measurements, or can be done, or can be obtained by using XRD measurements, or can, if it is a neutral orientation distribution function, it can also be assumed that it is neutral. So then, all the different grains get different uh, orientations, such that the overall orientation of the microstructure is more or less neutral. Aha, from the EBSD. Uh, Mr. Faisal, yeah. uh, Mr. Faisal uh, so do you use m uh, in your research? Well, what, what was the uh, function of m Do you know m -tex? Hmm, uh, very interesting. So m is basically used, for example, in this case. For example, in this case, what we do is we do, uh, we, um, do EBSD analysis of the microstructure, and then we get this image here. And uh, there are different tools and softwares which can be used to post-process this data. For example, to see what is the orientation distribution map of this area looks like, for example, constructing this figure. Or looking at where are the grain boundaries at each individual different phases, or constructing of this map. Do you understand? So each point has a lot of data, and we want to use a certain tool to quickly process their data and get our desired results. So MTEX is one MATLAB-based tool, which is open source, freely available online with a very heavy, strong documentation and a very strong community. And we are using it to um, post-process this data. Or, for example, in this case, it can also be used to get this um, aspect ratio uh, distribution or the equivalent radius of the grain distribution. Um, and then we were also using it to clean the data and export this EBSD as the text file, so it can be then constructed into a geometry file by Damask. So we are also using mtex to export um, um, text data from this file in such a way that it, um, it is in a um, in, uh, structure which is readable by Damask uh, subsidiaries and can be converted into a geometry file. So then we are using basically mtex for all these different reasons to uh, post-process the EBSD data, to, uh, to um, statistically analyze this data, and then exporting this data into our desired um, yeah, formats. I see. So you're using uh, MTEX? Uh, yes, but, the, but there are many others. So there, there, there are also tools which come with um, EBSD yeah, softwares. Yeah. Uh, EBSD, yeah. Um, devices. There is also HKL channel 5, 
which is a commercial software which is also used for these kind of analysis but in our case we just used index Any other questions? Um, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, sorry, yeah. Uh, what? Sorry, oh. um, okay. in this simulation, does the actual mm -hmm. direction of the grain plays a role? Does it influence the uh, plasticity? Yes, so here we see an example. So for example, what I did here is three, you will see that I plotted this graph along this line. Do you see this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when we plot the results from this line to this line, they're shown here. So these these lines represent the grain boundaries, and across that grain boundaries, there is another grain. And here I have shown them with different uh, yeah, cubic orientations to show that what, uh, what was the orientation of these grains in 3D space. And here you will see that when we go across these grains, we see changing the stresses and strains. And similarly, for example, for line four, which is even smaller, which is just crossing one grain boundary and one cementite particle present near a grain boundary, we see how stresses and strains are changing across the grain boundaries when the orientation is changing, when there is a cementite particle in the middle, and so on. So yeah, that uh, that is why we are using these models because they are depending on the crystal orientations. Um, the following that. I think in slide 24, so the um, basically the grain boundary is mapped to just the oscillatic phase, if I'm not mistaken, right? So basically the particle is just, um, like you said here, just the little damage criteria, mm -hmm. uh, elastic. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically, uh, um, my question is in this. Uh, simulation uh -huh. um, there is a uh, so the IPF may only just uh, it only applies to the austenite region the blue region and the red is uh, like uh, uh, there will be no like any elements or basically any elements in will not have all this uh, dislocation, transformation, and training physical. Uh, no, no. So this is all, the, these are zirconia particles. So they have different deformation attributes. So this is, they are not transforming, they are not twinning. Mm -hmm. They are just elastically deforming and then damaging at a certain criteria. So these are basically two different materials. And therefore, this has different overall properties and attributes. And this has different properties and attributes. Um, but we can model them together in one model and can see how they influence each other. Okay, so does that map actually scale with each other? Um, I mean, the, right now you have the IPM map, the face map. Does it actually mm. add the same scale? Yeah, yeah. So this is basically just the same RVE, just shown in two different ways. Uh, Fine then, one question then. Yeah. Uh, does your model uh, give any sequence uh, for which initiation will start first? If, let's say, hypothetically speaking, mm -hmm. uh, you have one micro crack and another mm -hmm. one great with favor to speech vector. So, by your uh, material modeling, it, does it uh, put any sequence? Which one will you start first? Ooh. Um, so simulation does not know, so when the, the, when the equations are being solved for every individual voxel or a solution point, they do not really know about um, what is happening. So the equation for when it is being solved for one solution point doesn't know what is happening in the other solution point. So it is just being solved for one case. And and there, if the conditions of the, if, of the uh, Shear, um, shear slip or damage uh, are, are um, satisfied and activated, it will just be recorded in the file. So then we need to post process the data to look at how the overall outlook of the RVE 
looks like, but generally it is. Yeah, recorded. Salt pen recorded this way. So I, I hope that answers yeah. your question. So means the how so how from from initiation it translate it trans it translate to propagation. Because mm. once you know initiation, then you know which path that the the the, the damage will move. Am I right? Not necessarily. So it 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 may it might stop if there is an inclusion in front of it, or it might stop if there is a if there is a grain. Or an a voxel which has not significantly deformed, and it can of course influence it to deform quickly and then damage. But yeah, it is it is like this. Uh -huh. So once initiation starts, then it will choose its direction, right? It will choose the yes. direction that it's based on. Yes, based uh -huh. on which next voxel has max next maximum principal uh -huh. strength. Uh -huh. Okay. And that maximum principal strain is basically depending on the orientation, phase, uh, overall deformation behavior, and then applied load, and many other things which we define. So if all those conditions are met, and the maximum principal strain is achieved, then the damage will propagate in that direction, mm -hmm. or it will not. If you say, so, if you have only two D R V E, so yes. yeah, so it's just like 360 option of direction, right? It will choose yes. with that. But if you have three three D means you have like spherical Yes direct. Oh okay. yes. And this one. Uh, one last question from me from my side. Uh, I'm planning to apply uh, this CPFEM uh, to failure analysis of uh, metallic product like boiler cube, something like that. So mm. my my uh, data is only uh, image from uh, optical microscope, metallurgical microscope. Mm. Then, is, is it possible that I can run CPFEM using that information only? If you have mechanical, uh, you need microstructural data as well as you also need oh, initial yeah. microstructural right. attributes. So, let's oh, say yeah. a stress strain curve. You yes, also need yes. one of that to know how the material is behaving for the calibration. Okay. And then, of course, you can. Yeah, so basically, we, I need to have three things only, right? Geometry, load, how 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 comes the load, load, and lastly, material config. Yes, configuration. Uh, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bayer. Okay. Any other questions? No. All right, Mr. Faisal. Yeah. Uh, we would like to thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So about coming to Malaysia, we will discuss later. Yeah, <laughs> I think if you have time, yeah. then we can uh, arrange that kind of uh, short course here. You know, yeah. But yeah. maybe we will, we will sure. discuss that uh, later. You know, yeah. What yeah. Then, yeah. So what? So what? So what we do here is um, we have a Damask user meeting here, okay. where all the new students who are coming in. Um, I start with them from the very basics of again start with the same presentation, uh, but relatively slowly. So, what is um, how the how the fundamentals of the material deformation behavior are, and then how we translate that into mathematics, and then how the crystal structures uh, play a role, and then based on that how we define it in Damask, and then how the files are constructed, and so on and so on. And we start with these simple examples with some hands-on training of, for example, now do this, now do that, and slowly build them up to a level where they are fully capable of understanding, for example, if I want to construct this microstructure, this is the way I can do it, and so on. And then run the simulations and all those things. So all this work which I showed you here in this slide is, yeah, was created more or less in the last five years. So it is not just one day or a, a, yes, a short term. Yes, yeah. Um, thing and specifically more importantly what I've learned along the way is um, Damask model and all the simulations are a little bit simpler they are just depending on all the data and information which we feed them the more important thing is how we are pre-processing the data for the simulations and then after simulations how we are post-processing the data so that we can get useful information out of it yeah and and that requires a lot of critical thinking and planning and programming and and data science and so on 
because it is a huge data set in the beginning as well for the material and then after the simulations have completed as well it just creates a lot of data and then it depends on the person who wants to use it for a specific application on what information do I need and how can I get out of this data set. So I feel that that is the more important and critical point. So all these nice images and pictures you see in these slides, I, yeah, I had a very hard time developing them by, by, by using different tools and different methods and different techniques and yeah. So, so I feel that is more time consuming and critical. Once you start working with Damask, then you realize, oh, I need to yeah, learn this. And, and that is why we have an ongoing um, process here where they are permanently engaged. And, and this uh, workshop uh, takes place every year, or how is it? Oh, it takes place after every two weeks because so we have many master students and PhD students who are continuously working on it. So basically, we discuss the progresses and and uh, several other things there, no, and no, no, all no. the small problems and challenges at hand every now and then. No, I mean, I mean this 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 uh, this workshop. You, are you doing once in yeah. a year, or how is it? So if we are, so it is not a workshop. It is just Damask user meeting. So we are meeting all the people who are working on Damask at our institute. We are meeting every two weeks ah, every to two discuss weeks. where we are and what are the challenges and how we can resolve them. Ah, you don't and do. And then we go back, do our work, and then meet again. Okay, you don't do any any like workshop every year once in a year something like that for the introduction of Damask and for open open public. I mean. We, we never felt a need for that, but if it is because we are a very small community who are working here, so we can meet three or four people can meet every two weeks or one month and can discuss all the things. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, if, if it is needed, it can be done and arranged. Why not? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Faisal, Faisal, can, can you include me uh, into the Damas meeting? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so the yeah. idea. So, so the, that is why I wanted to share this idea with you. The thing is, the thing is that um, we are having it now face to face. So we are having oh, it in okay. a very local no, like environment the, where, and also where there are many international students. So it is a mix of all the languages we are speaking. Some are German, some are. So depending on which student is working on what, it, it is that mix, and. But, but the idea which I was trying to convey here was that it is it is a relatively, I, I understand that it is a relatively tricky and longer process, but once you start the simulations, of course we can um, shift this meeting, if there are many users online, then of course we can shift this meeting online and we can meet every two weeks for one hour to discuss all these things, why not? Yeah, yeah. it's a good idea. Yeah, yeah update us. Yes, please update us, and then maybe our students who would like to uh, start with this can join also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Okay, Faisal. Yeah, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, it was a really, really informative uh, presentations. Yeah. So we hope yeah. that uh, yeah. we can continue also this uh, 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 using uh, Damas in our research. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, keep in touch. Yeah. So we have also some things sure. to discuss later on via email. Yeah. yeah. And sure. then yeah, yeah. Sure. From us. Thank yeah. Thank you very much, Faisal. Yeah. yeah. Have a nice day. Sure. Yeah. We will uh, we will close our day here. Uh, I think you just started there. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> it is yeah already half day. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very thank much, you, Faisal. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Right. Thank okay. you. Thank bye. You. Okay, uh, is that?